Vinny has his second home run in as many days. The Royals get their first base runner, their first hit, and their first run scored. And that is all the Royals would need last night as they go to Chicago and beat the White Sox 2 to nothing. Pascatino with a the homer there in the fourth, as you just heard. Kyle Isbell drove in Nick Lofton in the fifth. Royals win 2 nothing. Seth Lugo outstanding again. Went seven scoreless. Gave up four hits. He's now 3-0 and on the season. The Royals wish they could play the White Sox all the time. Five of their 11 wins are against the White Sox. They're 5-0 and against the White Sox. Royals are 11-6 overall. Game two of the three-game set, 640 tonight. Brady Singer, 2-0, and ERA under one, will face Jonathan Cannon, who making his Major League debut for the White Sox. Matt Cochero on Lugo's performance last night. Really impressive. You know, locating right out of the gate, as he does. He forces contact. I thought he got better as the game went on, too. I mean, a little more swing and miss towards the end. The bigger the breaking ball looked really sharp. Um, but what more can you say? I mean, seven, seven strut out. You can't get much better than that. So the Royals do win, and they are now 11-6 and six on the season. This is a sports ticket brought to you by Kiefer Brothers Automotive in Beloit, your home for fast, friendly auto repair. Coming up, a high school basketball coach has resigned. College hoops, uh, K-State men adding a guard from the portal. And I will give you three guesses as to who was the number one pick in the WNBA draft last night, and the uh, first two don't count. And really sad news about a colleague of ours in the industry. And the NBA play-in tournament begins tonight in the Western Conference. But first, local sports, and we hand it off to Dusty. Yeah, results from uh, Monday's action in the area in baseball. Beloit uh, against Ellenwood, and the Trojans get the sweep there on the road on Monday, 12-2 to in five innings in Game 1. And they took the second game 5-1. to Beloit's now 8-4 and on the season with those two wins uh, on Monday on the road. So... Again, that was baseball, softball uh, yesterday. Uh, makeup games, Republic County hosting Sylvan Lucas and uh, Republic County getting the sweep there 10-4 to in the first game and taking the second game 15-5 to in five innings. Uh, golf yesterday, Republic County Invitational in Belleville as well. Uh, Concordia took the uh, first place as a team with 320 was their total score. Beloit finished in fourth place. Individual champion was Dylan Esch of Southeast of Saline with a 73. Ahead of Lewis Van Meter of Concordia, who finished second with a 76. Carson Lister of Concordia, seventh and a tenth place finish for Dylan Tassell from Smith Center. And then in the uh, Plainville Invitational yesterday in Golf Hill City took first place as a team. Osborne was sixth. Dylan Budig of Hill City was the gold medal winner, 72 on the day. And Dawson Lance of Osborne finished in uh, a tie for 12th top finisher from the area there. Uh, if you missed any of those results, all that is posted at nckssports.com. Today's schedule, the Northern Plains League Golf Meet is taking place this afternoon in Tipton, so all of our area MPL teams will be competing there 3 o'clock this afternoon. Also, the Abilene Invitational, Concordia from the area competing there at 11 o'clock this morning in baseball and softball today. Uh, Sylvan Lucas at Ellis. Uh, Sylvan Lucas Lincoln baseball uh, at Ellis. Uh, four o'clock start for both baseball and softball. And Concordia's at Chapman in baseball and softball. 4.30 start time for the doubleheaders there in both of those sports as well. And finally, track and field today. The Republic County Invitational starting at 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, Beloit, Lakeside, Concordia, Lincoln, and Pike Valley from the area competing there. And also at the Plainville Invitational, Sylvan Lucas at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, again, full schedules, uh, standing, scores, whatever you need here. Spring sports, uh, as long as we get all that information, we post it when we receive it uh, at nckssports.com. So that's your home for high school sports here in north central Kansas. Yeah, it was a little windy at Ellenwood yesterday, to say the Probably least. Probably so. Although compared to a baseball tournament played in uh, oh, on a weekend with our youth baseball team, it was a breeze, <laughs> is what that was yesterday. Uh, Brett Rolfs has resigned as head boys basketball coach at Ellsworth High School. Rolfs led the Bearcats for the last two seasons, had a 31-14 record this past year. The Bearcats uh, went 19-5, and made it to the 3A state tournament. And uh, had Wellsville, who ended up being the state champions, on the ropes. They were up five. Ellsworth was over Wellsville in the fourth quarter, but couldn't finish it off. And then Wellsville went on to beat Beloit and Goodland for the state championship. So the Bearcats will be looking for a new head boys basketball coach. And listen, Ellsworth loses a ton. I mean, they lose a ton. Basically, they lose all their best players for the most part there they might there's a couple that are coming back but they lose their studs they're all leaguers and uh so Brett Rolfs is uh, is getting out while the 
while it was good. And, yeah. and listen, as a coach, you have that, that, that option. I'm not going to criticize it at all. Um, and it might have nothing to do with what's coming back next year. It might not have anything to do with that. Uh, his son was a senior, though. So yeah. he's done with his son's done playing. So then he's done. Um, so that's part of it. And we've seen this with coaches before over the years. And we've seen it in football in particular, where coaches yeah. uh, walk away as soon as uh, the talent dries up for a year or two. It's like, you know what? I'm going to hand this off to somebody else. And then there are others that just flat out will coach no matter what, and they will go through the downs to get back to the highs. And it's really to each their own. Um, but uh, Ellsworth will be looking for a new boys basketball coach. Brett Rolfs did a nice job there at Ellsworth, and they made it to state this year. And uh, now they'll have to uh, reload and reload with a new head boys basketball coach. Yeah, I, in those situations, and, and, and there's one football situation that I can think of here in the area. There's at least two that are right at the top of my mind. But there's one of them that I I actually feel like – by the person that stepped away, stepping away, it actually kind of helped the kids develop a little bit better when the mm-hmm. new guy came in, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's like that that was the right guy to lead a team that just didn't that had no varsity experience mm-hmm. really in football mm-hmm. because he had dealt with them actually in junior high too, but it was like a it's a great it's a really good transition actually. Um the other one was not <laughs> that right. I'm that's on the top of my yes, mind right I now. I know what you're <laughs> yeah. talking about. <laughs> that was just yeah, that was going to be a bad situation for whoever went into it I feel like, but right. um so yeah, there's there's sometimes it it does actually work out, right? Like when somebody that's been there quite a while decides to step down because either, you know, a senior that he has is graduating or you know, he, he knows that maybe he doesn't want to go through that rebuild process right mm-hmm. now. Um and somebody else steps in and takes it and then they run with it and and 2 3 years down the road it turns out to be the best thing that ever happened. So you, you just never know how those things are going to play out, but th- there's definitely precedent on both sides that I can t- think of in my mind and and you just you do have to wait until it plays out really i've talked to a various amount of coaches over the years and many times coaches that i get to know and i've gotten to know a lot of coaches in my time when i was when in college when i covered teams all the way up to um, when i was in seneca and then here in north central kansas and i've had conversations with coaches about this quite a bit in regards to you know how long do you think you're going to coach that's usually kind of my question is well how long do you think you're going to coach or do you enjoy coaching or is the you know are the things changing to where it's not worth your time anymore it's not like the coaches are getting rich uh, with their supplemental contracts to coach and so forth and you see a lot of rule 10 coaches now because you can't get coaches and some coaches don't want to some some teachers might be good coaches but they don't want to risk their full-time job mm-hmm. because that sometimes can get them fired especially if they're not tenured because of something that is simply a supplemental thing and so you gotta be very smart in regards to the coaching jobs you accept and and so forth and so on and and so the one of the common things that i've heard from various coaches i've talked to and this is spanning uh 25 to 30 years is one of the things that they say is, especially those that have been there for a while, if you've been there for a short period of time, I don't think it's that big a deal, but if you've been somewhere for a while, it's, there's going to be a time that I'm going to hang it up and I'm not going to coach anymore. Might be sooner than later. I'm not sure. Every year I contemplate it, or some people get to a point where they seriously contemplate it. And one of the things that coaches tell me is, well, you know, uh, you know, I've got, I got, you know, I got the particular kid or kids that uh, you may have connections with and you're like well i'll la- i'll go one more year because mm-hmm. i you know i don't i mean you know they're going to be a sophomore they're a junior i'll go one or two more years well guess what you're going to have the same issue two years from now because there's always going to be mm-hmm. somebody that you coached or you have a good relationship with maybe with a parent or you're, it's a friend of yours or even relation of yours and you're always going to be Especially if you do a good job, you're close to wanting to step down and move on and hand it to somebody else. And you get, like, trust me, I know this happens, you get peer pressured by people. Well, my kid's coming up. My kid's coming up. You need to coach long enough for my kid to come up. It's like, no, no, they don't. They need to do what's best for them. It ain't about your kid. You know, it's about what's best for that person and lord knows that these coaches many of them have put in plenty of time and paid their dues and then some earned the right to step away when they want to step away but for coaches that do value kids and their communities they have a hard time stepping away even though i think deep down they know when to step away or they know they want to step away but i think they get lobbied and politicked into and i think it's a guilt trip as well yeah that well you've got to coach my kid because he or she only has a year or two left no that you don't 
And it's not like you're, and then, and then, so the guilt trip is, then you feel like if you, if you step away, what? You're letting them down. Yeah. Well, that's not the way to, to, to approach this, your life decisions is no. trying to please other people. All right. And I know of particular people that are only worried about pleasing everybody and worried about their reputation and their ego. And, and then are off base with some of the things that they do because they're trying to maintain an image or an ego. And you don't need to worry about that. What you need to worry about is what's best for you in particular. So that is one of the things that coaches worry about when they are thinking about stepping away is, well, what about the next class? Or what about the next group? Or I don't want to. And there's some coaches that don't care if they hand off a bare cupboard to the next coach. There's some coaches that say, I Mm -hmm. would hate for my successor have nothing. So I'll go a few more years to make sure things are stable, you know, or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And that's admirable of them. There are some coaches that are, um, they're, they're worried about what will happen when they step away in regards to what if the wrong coach is hired? Well, that's not your problem anymore. But because you, if you build a program, you feel yeah. it's your problem. But once you step away, that is not your problem anymore. And I get it. I mean, it happens in everyday life. When you move from one job to another, you're worried about maybe things that your previous job, your current job, where you're going to be leaving for something else. You're worried about it. But technically, it's not your responsibility. Because once you're gone, you're gone. And it's up to other people to pick up the slack. It's up to other people to make the decisions that they need to make to keep that institution or that program going in the right direction. And you need to do what's best for you. Does that mean you're selfish? Maybe, maybe, but you also have your family to worry about. How many coaches give up time? How many coaches give up time with their kids by coaching? A ton. Mm -hmm. How many coaches, uh, even if they're coaching their own kids, are giving up various aspects? So there is this worry by coaches. Well, if I step away, oh no, who's going to take over? Because I hate to see this thing run into the ground. There's oh, no, I'm not going to coach this kid or that kid, and you get pressure from parents saying, oh, please, 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 please coach another year or two, which is flattering that they like you so much. It's flattering that they care about you. But they really, do they care about you, or do they care more about their kids being coached by you? See, that's the, that, and I've got that as well from a broadcaster. Well, really happy for you or whatever else, but... It's more about, it ain't about them being happy for a particular person, even though that's how they play it. It's, they're more worried about, oh, who's going to call the games? Or who's going to coach my kid? Well, somebody will. There will be somebody. It it, it might be somebody better. And you don't even know it. Mm -hmm. It might be somebody worse. And it might be a train wreck. All those things can happen. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the known versus the unknown. That's a simple, that's what it is. That's what Mm -hmm. it comes down to. The known versus the unknown. You know, I've talked with the various youth coaches that I've worked with, and there are a lot of coaches in the stands, but they never step up and volunteer to coach, and we are, and we don't get a paid a dime for it, mm-hmm. and we lose sleep at night, even at youth sports coaches, and trust me, high school coaches do, and higher level coaches do too, but the difference is high school coaches do get paid something, okay? College coaches get paid quite a bit in some situations mm-hmm. of course pro coaches if you're a volunteer coach you don't get paid a dime okay and your high school coaches don't get paid if you do the math how many hours they put in they might make 50 cents an hour okay maybe mm-hmm. so the point i'm trying to make is i've talked with other friends of mine that coach and it seems like it's the same people coaching over and over every single sport and i finally got to a point where i coach my oldest son in almost everything and a, one sport I coached I didn't know much about because nobody had the, you know, the gumption to step up and coach. So I was coaching something I didn't even know much about. I had to study it on the, on the fly. It was mm-hmm. soccer. I didn't know much about soccer. But I finally got to a point in my life where I was like, you know what? I'm coaching basketball. I don't need to coach flag football. Mm-hmm. Somebody else can do it. And you know what? I can coach baseball, but I don't need to be the head coach in baseball. I can just help out. So, and, and there's a couple of reasons why I say this. One, if you're coaching the same kids over and over and you coached them at every single sport, they're going to get tired of hearing your voice. Mm-hmm. No matter how great you think you sound, they're going to get sick of hearing you. Okay? Just like kids at home get sick of their parents saying mm-hmm. the stuff. But if your neighbor says the same thing, they suddenly go, oh, yeah, I get it. What do you mean? I just said that a thousand times. But it means something coming from somebody else, a different voice. And so I've talked with a few people that agree with me in the youth coaching ranks and, the, and one of the things they say, which I think of as well, 
But if I don't step up and volunteer, then somebody else may, but they might not know what they're doing, and it's going to be a train wreck, and at least I know what I'm doing. And I get that. But at some point, you're going to have to step away. Whether it's youth coaching, high school coaching, whether you're a teacher, it could be like, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be sports. It could be you're the you're the general manager of an institution. You're the co CEO of a, of a company. You're the insurance adjuster manager. I don't know. Come up with anything you want. The sales manager at a car dealership. Eventually, we're all going to die, and we're all going to be replaced, and life will move on. So you may think you're really, really valuable, and people will try to build you up to be very, very valuable, mainly because they have their own selfish interest at Mm -hmm. hand. But guess what? They'll adjust. Just like if you die tomorrow, they'll adjust. There'll still be sports, and there'll be somebody that'll coach them. And it may be good. It may not be good. But since you're still alive and they like you, You're supposed to keep giving up all the things you've sacrificed all the years because you're supposed to do what's best for their kid who you probably don't even know very well in some cases. So if you're a coach and you're thinking about, you know, when's the right time to step away? I'm going to tell you right now, there is no right time to step away. No, not if you're invested in it. No, no. No. Now, if you've coached for a couple of years and your whole idea was to go in and I'm going to coach this loaded team for the next two or three mm-hmm. years, this loaded class, and I'm getting out, which we've seen happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's a little different. But if you've actually invested and you've been a coach for a significant amount of time, and no matter whatever sport it is, or even a teacher as well, it's like, when's the best time to retire? When's the best time to step away? When's the best time to move to another opportunity? It may feel like the best time. But it may never be the best time. Mm-hmm. You just have to do what you have to do. Absolutely. I, that's That uh, goes across many, in many life. places in yeah. life, right? You do what is best for you. you got to look out for number one for the most part. And, right. and you know, if, if you're not, then you are uh, serving other people. And, you know, some, some people, that's what they do, right? Like, that's just a different, you know, direction that they've been pulled and some things you actually have to serve other people right mm-hmm. but in these kind of decisions and situations uh i'm always going to be like yeah look out for whatever you think is best for you and obviously coaching is really at the top of that list after you've invested that much time mm-hmm. and then you're figuring out hey like you said there's just no right time if you've been in this for five, six, seven years, you've invested all this time and effort, and and the, the kids look up to you, they appreciate you, they respect you, and, and then now you've got to make a decision of when do I step aside? Mm-hmm. When's when's the end for me here? Right. And sometimes, unfortunately, that's not decided by the actual person either. Mm-hmm. So um, when you get to that point, then you, you've kind of lost some touch on some of these things, but. It, for the most part, if you're the one making that decision, it's, I agree with you. There's never the right time. But no. you got to figure it out for what's best for yourself. You might think it's the right time, and it may be. And then you might not find out it isn't. But you don't know until you do it. In college hoops, the K-State men's basketball team picked up another guard from the transfer portal with the commitment of C.J. Jones out of Illinois, Chicago. The six foot five versatile guard put up nine points per game over his two seasons. He averaged 11 half points, four and eight. assists, 3.5 rebounds last season. Not a high-volume three-point shooter. 38% from beyond the arc this past season on 82 attempts. He's the second guard to commit to Jerome Tang's Wildcats as Michigan point guard Doug McDaniel signed earlier this offseason. So, K-State adding another guard from the portal, which that's just the way the life of college (laughs) athletics goes. You're trying to get people from the portal, and you focus on it. You try to fill the holes on your roster, and that's what KU, K-State, and every single Division I team in America is doing any thoughts on that well we got cj jones and rj jones now and yeah, who thanks. else are we gonna get now? Thank, thanks coach <laughs> tang for making that confusing greatly appreciate that Come uh on. yeah they, i just get guys and i don't know anything about this guy we'll we'll learn about him yes we will coming up in 30 <laughs> seconds uh the number one pick in the wnba draft uh, i think you probably know who it is I'm Elijah at Kiever Brothers Automotive in Beloit. Did you know that we sell tires? We also perform alignments and all the other services that go along with them. We handle all the top brands. Extras like road hazard warranty, complimentary tire rotations, and complimentary tire repairs are available for purchase on most tires. Right now, we are offering $80 off when you buy a set of four. Call or stop by Kiever Brothers Automotive for fast, friendly tire services today. Find us just south of the courthouse in Beloit or on the web at keeverbrothers.com. 
with the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. No way! Caitlin Clark's going shocking. to the Fever? I am stunned by this development. Uh, no surprise there, of course. Caitlin Clark, the all-time leading scorer in Division I history. First pick WNBA draft. Here's Caitlin Clark on heading to Indiana to play for the Fever. Is it going to be cowbell fever? And I got some fever for cowbell. Yeah, I, for some reason, I think every time I hear the word fever, I think oh, those of that gifts SNL were all skit. over the place last night after yeah. they picked. Oh, yeah. I got a fever. I got a fever. By, by the way, you got to see the latest Saturday Night Live. Sometimes <laughs> Saturday Night Live is not very funny. Sometimes it is. The Beavis and Butthead sketch, you've got to Google that and watch it. If you watch Beavis and Butthead, know what Beavis and Butthead is about. That show, remember it back in the day on MTV, and then there was movies and so forth and so on. You've got to watch the five minute skit with Saturday Night Live on that. Oh my goodness gracious. Here's Clark on heading to Indiana and be part of the FIBA. The biggest thing is like they have such a good roster and that's what I'm excited about. They're a winning franchise. Um, you know, I'm excited to get there. I'm excited to get to Indianapolis. I know there's a lot of people, Aaliyah right here, I know there's a lot of people at Gainbridge uh, tonight supporting us in the, in the picks that we're going to make. So, um, you know, I know they'll be supporting all summer long. you got to buy your tickets now. I know it'll be a hot ticket, but um, I think the biggest thing is just do me, have fun, smile. Um, I've loved playing basketball since I was a young girl, and that's not going to change. All of her jerseys already sold out. Every si- every seriously, this is a true story. Every, I believe it. Every size, every size, small, medium, large, extra large. Her Indiana Fever jerseys already sold out. Dude, I'm going to tell you something. This, she is the transcendent women's athlete. She is the Steph Curry of women's sports, or you could say she's the Patrick Mahomes of women's sports. But to me, she's a Steph Curry of women's sports because her game, I think, is similar to Curry from the standpoint that they shoot so far, they're great passers, they they got great range, and I think they make their teammates better. And I think she's going to do just fine in WNBA, by the way. She needs to develop more of a mid-range game. I think she will. Um, She might have some hiccups. Obviously, she probably will. But this is, listen, I would like to know what the WNBA draft ratings were because I bet they were higher last night than normal WNBA drafts. Mm-hmm. Every game that Caitlin Clark was in, the ratings were higher, especially in the NCAA tournament. The NCAA tournament championship game for the women drew for 4 million more viewers than the men's title game, for crying out loud. And UConn was going for a repeat in history. Um, the WNBA will skyrocket in regards to um, their ratings, in particular with the Fever games. And she said, get your tickets now. In some cases, you may not be able to already. Mm-hmm. Uh, 36 of the 40 Indiana Fever games will be nationally televised. Think about that. On a whole different, I mean, like all the different networks. Mm-hmm. It's not just one network. It's not some obscure network you never heard of. So it's an exciting time for WNBA. And it's college basketball's loss. And that's what will be interesting to see going forward, how the college basketball women's game proceeds after life after Clark going to the WNBA. But there's no doubt that people have a fever. Mm-hmm. For Caitlin Clark in the WNBA now, and there are also some other really good, talented players that people now actually know: Angel Reese, Carduso, and others. But as somebody point out, and somebody thinks it's kind of a joke, but maybe there's some serious to it. This one person put out there on Twitter: I know more names, I know more of the names announced in WNBA draft than I do the NBA draft, and that could be possible for some people. Listen, it ain't far away from me. Yeah, I mean, I there's a ton of international there's players. There's so many people don't know who get they drafted are. in the NBA. Even college guys, I'm like, who is that? Who like are freshmen people? that came out or right. something that you just really never watched their right. games or uh-huh. something. Yeah, and and as I get older, I don't watch as much of really anything unless it's my team playing. Right, uh-huh. like I'm always glued to those games for the most part. But yeah, I mean, if you're doing it the right way, wait, it's funny though because like last night was the one WNBA draft that I was more apt to not watch because I knew what was going to happen. Right? right, like I've actually watched some NBA drafts because I'm just seeing if K State players were going to get drafted and think right. WNBA drafts just to see if K State players were going to get drafted or not. Last night I was like, well, I know who one and two are going to be, and I'll just figure out the rest of it. Right, like right. who's going to go after you know Clark and Brink? But it's like. 
after that, you're just kind of like, yeah, this is it's, it's interesting because I know that there I know for a fact one person that was watching it that never would have watched it ever in the past. Yeah. And so there were more people watching. Absolutely. It. They, just, they wanted to see what Caitlin Clark was probably going to say about going to Indiana and things like that. And she is the moment right now. So um, if you're paying attention to women's sports, I agree with you. She's it. And, and you know, what, whatever name you want to put in there, if it's Patrick Mahomes or Steph Curry or Michael Jordan, whoever it is, that's who she is right yes. now. And and so it's pretty obvious if her jerseys are selling out. Obviously, they can produce more of those, but uh, yeah. they're not in the. They're, you can't put a, put them in the cart right now. It is going to be very interesting to see what she does in the WNBA, though, because you know obviously she's going to have some success probably. But uh, you know, uh, I was watching a clip with Kelsey Plum the other day on the Pat McAfee show, and she averaged like almost thirty two points a game her senior year at Washington before Caitlin Clark was the all time leading scorer in Division One in NCAA at one point. So. Uh, in women's basketball averaged eight points a game a rookie year in the WNBA I mean she, she's great now right mm-hmm. she's helping lead the aces to championships right. with, with Asia Wilson and all that but she actually there was a learning curve and there yeah. was something that she had to do and learn and, and mm-hmm. continue to improve on mm-hmm. when she came into the WNBA and, and I'm I'm gonna say that Caitlin Clark's probably not gonna average 30 points a game when she gets to the WNBA and thinks people should probably be ready for that she might average 19 to 20 still I say I, I, do, I doubt she averages she's eight not, she's not gonna go down to eight I wouldn't no, predict I wouldn't either. but there will be a, a curve there where she's got to learn that people are gonna play her a little bit more physical and they're gonna do different things and they're gonna they're gonna be athletic enough to do different things with her too her first game in the wnba i think will be to the level and this may sound crazy to say but i think it's not far-fetched at all her first game in the wnba will be as anticipated and as watched and covered by espn as lebron james first game as an nba player coming to high school and i bet you people are trying to let that comment soak in right now (laughs) but i'm talking about LeBron wasn't about his gender. LeBron was about a freak athlete that was amazing, that was anointed as King LeBron James, the chosen one on the front page of Sports Illustrated, age of 17, 18, that had high school games nationally televised. Caitlin Clark represents a gender, man. I mean, we're not talking LeBron representing Akron, Ohio, and an amazing 18-year-old athlete. We had seen many amazing Mm -hmm. 18-year-old athletes before. This one was just even more amazing. Caitlin Clark is representing an entire sex and that is women in sports and there will be a whole bunch of women that maybe not even interested in sports and there'll be a lot of guys that are not interested in WNBA that are going to and some of you some people might not want to really in, engage in any of it and you're going to have it shoved down your throat no matter what because it'll be on social media and this and this and top story Caitlin Clark's first game and I don't know what the day is and who they play I should look it up but it will be legendary now whether she plays well I have no idea and if she gets hurt or if she plays horribly or great, that has nothing to do with how anticipated it's going no. to be, the ratings that game will get, and the money that the Indiana Fever and the WNBA will make. And imagine if she goes out there in the first game and scores 30 or more. The mm-hmm. first game. That will just add to everything. There's a lot of pressure on her, yeah. Uh, you know, in regards to she, you know, she's going to carry the torch. But there are going to be people in the WNBA that are going to be gunning for her. Diana Taurasi said it. Like they're going to be, they're going to be like, yeah, you're, you, you had a cool little run in, in college. That's pretty neat and all, but now you're a pro, not oh, an yeah. amateur. And she's going to be hip checked. She's going to be fouled hard. They're going to be people they're going to want. Be, they're going to be hunting for, and she's going to have to be ready for that. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I mean, they're they're not going to be afraid to be physical. No, this is not a this. I mean, every time you go up a level, it's a more grown up league, right? No matter what you're in, and so. The people that are there are always some of the best in the world when you get to that level, and they're not going to be afraid of you at all. The Indiana Fever, they have two preseason games. I didn't know that WNBA had preseason games. So yeah, I didn't know how many there were, but I knew they had them. But the Indiana Fever will play in Arlington, Texas, uh, against the Dallas Wings. It's a preseason game on May the 3rd, another preseason game on May the 10th, and then their first ever regular season game with Caitlin Clark on their team is May 14th and that will be not at home which was would be nice if it was mm-hmm. at Indianapolis it's going to be in Connecticut at Mohegan Sun Arena I'm pulling up I'm going to click on tickets here for the preseason game man well, didn't didn't give me anything here let's let's go let's go to Indiana Fever season single game tickets 
Um, let's see, preseason. Let's just go ahead. Let's go here and go in preseason, buy tickets, see what we got. <laughs> uh, okay, sure. I'll accept that. And yeah, I guess there's some cheap tickets in the very top. Uh, yeah, nothing on the lower level. It's all upper level. All the lower level looks like it's already gone. Probably had gone for the season. Probably in the so. Lower level. Probably so. <laughs> what was the? Uh, okay, that would be their first regular season game. Let's look at that one, real quick, ticket wise, as it loads. Oh yeah, it's a whole different deal. Whole different deal. First regular season game at Indianapolis for Caitlin Clark. If you want to sit in the upper level in the nosebleeds, minimum forty bucks, which is crazy for yeah, where women's yeah. sports usually is if you want to sit lower level and you want to sit mid-court thousand dollars yeah for a WNBA game I bet you if I go another team site it ain't that much <laughs> no wow so that's the that's that's why you draft her number one whether she's gonna Vegas be any good or not winning all the time yeah. their their tickets probably mid-level lower probably 250 <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> right I mean that's the power of star power that's exactly what that is hey um some sad news to report. I don't know if Dusty saw this or I not. I did see this last night, I think. But, uh, yeah, um, a friend of ours, a friend of mine, um, he's been on our show before, though it's been a few years since we've had him last on, uh, Greg, Greg Sharp, he used to be the voice of the K-State Wildcats, and he's the voice of the Nebraska Cornhuskers, uh, revealed on his show last night on Sports Nightly that uh, he has cancer. And so he's going to have to do treatments. He might miss some sports talk shows, and he may miss some baseball play-by-play. He hopes to have everything taken care of and ready to go full bore in the football season. Um, he was kind of reluctantly shared that information. He didn't really want to, but he said, you know, I felt like I needed to because people are going to wonder, where is Greg? What's happened with Greg? Why isn't he at the, doing his show? Or why isn't he at a baseball game? So, uh, and his, his wife is an amazing person. He, t- he mentioned her as well. Amy, who used to be a TV anchor there at KSNT in Topeka, if you remember back in the day. Um, but Greg Sharp, the voice of the Huskers, who, of course, was a terrific voice of the K-State Wildcats, um, he has cancer. He said pancreatic area is what he said, which is scary. Um, Cringe every time I hear that. I know. Yeah, I think a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so he didn't go into super great detail about it. But he did mention it, and so uh, thoughts and prayers go out to Greg Sharp and his family and hope that uh, he uh, kicks its butt, as he said last night. Yeah, no doubt. I, Yeah, that uh, brings back some bad memories when when I hear pancreatic, for sure. Um, but, yeah, it, if you catch it early enough, obviously, mm-hmm. and it seems like this might be the case with Greg if he's mm-hmm. planning on right. you know just missing some of this stuff and being for some of it. And, right ready for football hopefully that that is the case and and that they've caught it early and and they'll be able to nip it in the bud here and and he'll be he'll be right back to normal in no time we certainly hope so yep the nba play-in tournament begins tonight in the western conference seven seeded pelicans host the eight seed lakers at 6 30 on tnt i don't think anybody's picking the pelicans to win this game lakers have stomped them this year but i think it'd be hilarious if the pelicans beat them thing is the lakers could still make it into the playoffs even if they lose there's some people arguing lakers should to tank should tank tonight lose so they avoid the Nuggets then win the next one against either the Kings or Warriors so they can play the Thunder in the first round. The only thing is then you put yourself and really danger, truly yeah. on the break. Yeah. Because what happens if LeBron or Anthony Davis well Anthony Davis always gets hurt but what happens if LeBron gets hurt in first quarter of the game against Warriors Kings and now your season's over. So do you really chance those things? No I don't think you do. Uh, but that was thrown out there I, I understand the thinking. I do it. too I, I probably would rather play the Thunder. Thunder than the Nuggets if I was the Lakers sure. right now. Yeah I agree with that. So uh, Pelicans and Lakers, uh, that'll be in New Orleans as well. 6.30 on TNT. The winner wraps up the seventh spot and gets a date with the Nuggets in the first round defending NBA champs. The loser will host the winner of the second game tonight as the nine-seed Kings host the 10-seed Warriors at 9 o'clock on TNT. Uh, Last year, the Warriors beat the Kings in Game 7 in Sacramento to stay alive and then got uh, beat by the Lakers in the semifinals of the Western Conference. Um, You know, I've got the Kings and Lakers winning tonight. I don't think the Warriors are going to do anything with it, but I think they're going to win the night. Okay. If you think it's rigged, then the Lakers and Warriors are going to win. And I think possibly the Lakers and Warriors could, you know, the Warriors might beat the Pelicans too. So, okay. But again, I don't think the Warriors are going to go anywhere after that. You got the Hawks and the Bulls tomorrow night uh, in Chicago, Atlanta at Chicago, and that's a nine versus 10. And the uh, 
Sixers host the Heat, the 7-8. That's the playing games of the Eastern Conference. Those are tomorrow night. Team USA didn't even medal at the 2023 FIBA World Cup. And with the Olympics looming, USA basketball was determined not to let that happen again. Superstars around the NBA have expressed interest in playing. Team USA has now settled on 11 of the 12 players on their roster that they will take to Paris over this summer to try to get the gold in the 2024 Olympics. Here are the players that are on the team, and you tell me if you think there's any problems with this list. LeBron James, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, Joel Embiid, Jason Tatum, Devin Booker, Drew Holiday, Anthony Davis, Anthony Edwards, Bam Adebayo, Therese Halliburton. Are there enough basketballs? No. We need (laughs) at least 10. And that's being conservative here. What do you think of the makeup of this team? Obviously star power, but that doesn't translate necessarily into cohesion and being yeah, great, the and they're going to practice together for what, a few months, a few weeks, and then try to beat teams that have played together for many years that maybe don't play together all the time, but they've played together quite a bit, and they get their select team back together, and then they beat the USA. Yeah, I, I'm kind of like, Obviously, that's a team that that has studs. There's sure. no question about it, and they're all studs. But here's the thing: like that, that is weird to me about it is like I, they've got a decent mix of older and younger, and, and with Halliburton there and Tatum, you know, and Anthony and, Edwards. Anthony Edwards. They've got young, but they've also got old, and they've got old that's hurt quite a bit too. So on some of those, like Anthony Davis, you're talking about can get hurt at any point in time. Which, but this roster, yeah, you got a tremendous bench, so I'm not yeah, but, worried well, about that's injuries. not. I'm not worried about the injuries as far as they can still win but if I was a team in the NBA that had one of my guys playing there and they're already having issues with injuries like if I'm the Warriors and Steph Curry gets hurt and he's toward you know coming on the backside of his career KD and all these guys Anthony Davis LeBron obviously it's like yeah that's fun it's a it's a good team those young guys better be ready to carry this load, though. If some if the, if these guys can't go the right amount of minutes and they get tired, because there are some older people in there, and they're going to be playing. You know, they're coming off of who knows how long they're going to make it in the postseason here, and then they're going to have a little bit of a break. Then they're going to get mm-hmm. into the Olympics, and then again after they get done with the Olympics, it's not too long after that they're going to be hitting training camp, and so some of these teams are probably going to be like, I wish you wouldn't do that, mm-hmm. but. And, and, but that's the issue. If you want to have a winning team and if you want to have a team that's going to compete and try to win a gold medal, I mean, you've found that out in the past, the U.S. has. If you don't have these kind of players on the team, your chances to go to win a gold medal go drastically down because of the parity that's around world basketball right now. So you've got to figure all that out and figure out who's there. And then I hear, like, the, the, the best op- option – for the 12 spots, Kawhi Leonard. And it's like, well, he's hurt more than any of them. Mm-hmm. And why would the Clippers want want him to play in it? But, you know, it's just a lot, you got to make those decisions and, and you got to do that. If you want, if you really want to win, you got to make hard decisions. A lot of the star players in the past haven't wanted to play in it because of the reasons you gave. Yeah. You, you, there is no offseason, this and that. But I think LeBron, you know, there, have been, there has been criticism of LeBron, of course, over the years, over various things, some warranted, some unwarranted. You know, the slam dunk thing, you know, that's on LeBron because mm-hmm. if LeBron would have done the slam dunk, this, I think the slam dunk contest would be a bigger thing and it's, you know, turned into stars not wanting to do it. And LeBron kind of led the way because George. Jordan Wilkins and those guys did it. LeBron's never done it. Although to Kobe me, Kobe did it. Yeah, Kobe did it. But but to me, that that's not as big a deal as no. the Olympics. And I will say, I think LeBron does for all the heat he catches. I think LeBron sets the tone here. Listen, if I can be, if I'm 39 or 40 and I can go do this again for my country mm-hmm. and go try to win a gold again. There's no excuse for you other yahoos. There's no excuse for Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Jason Tatum, Devin Booker, Drew Holiday, Anthony Davis, Anthony Edwards, Joel Embiid, Bam Adebayo, Tyrese Halliburton. In fact, you guys are way younger. All of you are younger than me. Mm-hmm. So I think LeBron does kind of set the tone. Had he decided to not do it, I think half these guys don't yeah, do it. I agree. To be honest with you. But um, I'll tell you the guy, I'll tell you a couple guys I think are key to this team. There's three guys that are really key to this team, and they won't be the guys that everybody's going to talk about because everybody's going to be like, oh, LeBron, Steph, and Durant. Drew Holiday, mm-hmm. that's a guy you need on a team like this. He doesn't have to score to be effective, he's a great defender. Uh, Tyrese Halliburton is Absolutely. an amazing yeah. passer, outstanding passer. Halliburton could average one point a game and go nuts with this team. And Bam Adebayo. Those are your three role players on this team. 
Okay, Drew Holiday, Bam Adebayo, and Tyrese Halliburton. And to me, they have to have one of those guys on the floor probably at all times. Now, I know LeBron's a great passer and so forth and so on. And, and so that helps too. But he's also 40 years old. Anthony Edwards, I think it'll be a great experience for him to take his game to another level, which he's already becoming. Maybe he's going to be a star of this team. Mm-hmm. He could very well be. Because Durant, Curry, and LeBron are getting long in the tooth. You know, Embiid on this team is kind of interesting as well because Embiid is a guy that is an offense that typically it's throw Embiid the ball let's do the old school NBA. With this team, I don't think you really want to do that so much. I think you want to get up and down. Um, and I don't, you know, like there are certain guys on this team I look at, I'm like, what exactly is their role going to be? Like, you know, Devin Booker and Jason Tatum, I'm like, okay, those guys should be two of the alpha dogs on this team. But is LeBron, Steph, and Kevin Durant going to take a back seat to these to the guys that are in the middle of their primes? Because Steph and Kevin Durant and LeBron are all still outstanding players. But to me, there's no doubt they're on the backside of their careers. Yeah. These other guys, Embiid, Tatum, Booker, you know, Anthony Davis to me is on the backside of his career mm-hmm. too. But Booker, Tatum, Embiid, and Anthony Edwards, those four stand out to me as they're the young guns that that really they're the ones that are going to have to be step up and play well because they're in the middle of their prime. They can't yeah. be they can't just be a role player off the bench in my opinion. No, I these Tatum are, these needs are to MVP be, type I, I, Tatum teams. needs to be like I think almost the stud of this probably team. the leader. Yeah, I agree like, with you. I, you know, which but, he won't be. He won't be. The he leader. won't. But but as far as yeah. by example of what he does, right. and how he performs, Agreed. I think he needs to be at the top of that list. He just can't sit on three point line waiting to shoot no. threes. And and you know if if I think if if they need to, I think it's good to have a guy like Embiid on this team if you have to play a different style, right? right. Like if you if if some team is just kind of taking you out of what. You, what you want to do getting up and down the floor, shooting threes, obviously, mm-hmm. is a, is the, the way the game's changed at all levels and, and internationally as well, right? And so, you know, you've got those kind of guys and Steph Curry and, and Booker and, and Tatum that can do that. And, and you know, Embiid can do that technically. I mean, he's not going to do it a lot, but you uh, you have a – I think you have a roster that's built to have success in, in some different ways here. But – it's it's hard for me to believe that they're all going to be ready to go and in the right shape that they need to be going into it. Is there is there I mean, e- everything has to go right for them? Is there ever an organization that would pray really hard that Embiid like maybe gets hurt right at the end of the playoffs so he doesn't go there? Because <laughs> Embiid he gets hurt a lot. We talk about Anthony Davis. Yeah, he's at the top of the, the, of the a, list of the younger Embiid's guys. Embiid's in the Embiid, prime of yeah. his career. Edward, Ed, uh, Anthony Davis is not. So if there's you're talking about teams that probably don't want these guys yeah. going there, I would think the Sixers would be at the, the top Sixers of the list. Sixers, for sure, yeah. And, I, you know, and, and it's everybody, really. I mean, even I mean, the Lakers, Lakers too. too. Usually the Pacers, like you know, I mean, I yeah, know the sure. guy's young and he's right. got legs, but if he has some kind of freak injury while well, he's Paul in, George, in the Olympics, remember Paul yeah, George? Exactly. That was a that was a pre that was qualifier. I think he got hurt. Yeah, shattered his leg. Look if Halliburton has some kind of weird injury, and he was with a member of the Pacers. Yeah, exactly. And Halliburton, and so the they Pacers. they remember, and it's oh like, yeah, yeah, it's fun, but man. All the things that maybe could go wrong to start creeping into your mind about all that stuff. If you're if you're part of an organization, like I'm not yeah. thinking about that. I want right. Team USA sure. to win a gold medal. Sure. Doesn't matter to me, but yeah. it definitely matters to them. No doubt. A couple other things to finish the show here. Um, one, uh, Patrick Mahomes is on the cover of the Time 100 magazine. Um, and so there's different takes from this article. Not different takes, but excerpts. And this is one posted on, this is about Mahomes, on his curiosity about pursuing a two-sport career. Mahomes said, and I quote, I've talked to the Royals, and if I can maybe go out to a spring training, I'm not opposed to that. I'll get it approved by the Chiefs and everything like that. But maybe one of these years I go out there and see what I got, see if I can still hit the ball or pitch or whatever that is. Maybe not in the game, but at least I could practice with them. I know no problem with that. There's nothing wrong with that. He was asked, you know, you know, how long would he play? And he said, well... He said, uh, you know, if I play as long as Brady does, and my daughter will be 18 or 19 years of age, and if I can still play and not uh, and, and, and still support her and do and be there for her for various things, then I'll keep playing. But he said, if that prevents me from being there for my daughter, he said that will probably be the indicator that it's time for me to go. These are pretty deep comments and thoughts from a guy that his kids are very, very young, mm-hmm. and he's 28 years old. But I think that just gives you a little inside look at the brain of Patrick Mahomes and how he's so far ahead of the game. He's already thought about these things. Oh, yeah, for sure. Most, most people his age, especially if they're that famous, 
never even give that a thought. They're just thinking, I'm going to play forever. I'm going to cash in as much money and I can get and so forth and so on. So he is a unicorn. He is a rare breed in the Chiefs, of course. And we in Chiefs Kingdom are extremely fortunate to have the guy. Um, but can you imagine if he went to spring training? He says not playing a game. But what if he some? Now, first of all, I don't think Chiefs will let him play in a game. But with all the money they invested yeah. in him, would they let him go to spring training? Maybe. Maybe. They let him go. But I think the Chiefs would have some very particulars. Like, you're not facing a live pitcher because we don't <laughs> want you to get hit in the head, even if you have a helmet on. I mean, so I think the Chiefs, when they read that excerpt, are probably going, well, we might – we might let him do something in spring training someday, but there are going to be a lot of language in a waiver of some kind he's going to have to sign. There's probably plenty in the contract already. You can walk around with a uniform on. Yeah, right. That's yeah. what you can do. Yeah, right. You, you That's can, what you, you can, can do. You can pick up a training. baseball and throw it to somebody, but you cannot catch one you from anybody. Him sitting out there throwing gas, oh, like in, and he hurts his Tommy arm. Tommy John surgery comes oh, up after God, that. God, no. That's not happening. No, God, no. You can talk about it all you want, but this is 2024. It's not Bo Jackson late well, 1980s, well, well, see, but Deion Bo, Sanders right. early 1990s. It's a different era, but Bo Jackson wasn't a quarterback. Exactly. So he could hurt his arm and still carry the football. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but Mahomes is. The, yeah, there's so much. His that, right arm is yeah. is like a billion dollars. Yeah, so he's like the billion dollar arm. Yeah, you don't <laughs> want him to be throwing in spring training or anything like that, or throwing anywhere. If it's not a football in training camp or a preseason game or a real NFL game or practice, listen, it's got to be. Anything. It's got to be throwing anything anywhere. It's got to be stationary. See a ball on the ground, hit it. That's called golf, and that's all he should be allowed to play. And I say that one up, maybe swing it. Tennis, I think, is a mistake. He could, you know, totally mess up the rotator cuff. You know, of course, you can swing a golf club and hurt yourself too. But uh, that's for us old people. Usually, get hurt doing that. Yeah, you know, when I usually get hurt playing golf, when I'm searching for my lost golf ball and there's some scratchy bushes or thorns, that's when I get hurt. Searching my golf ball. And finally, this one, and I can't say that I'm really surprised because you know. There are rumors out there that Rory McIlroy may be joining Live Golf for $850 million. This is a writer that covers golf. He says, if these rumors are true, it's over for the PGA Tour. The government of a foreign nation will have successfully used its balance sheet to orchestrate a hostile takeover of a major United States professional sport. At $850 million, Liv is offering the third highest earning golfer in history, roughly 10 times what he has earned his entire 15-year career to leave the PGA Tour. Why would they offer such an insane number? Because it's a foreign government that has other motives besides profit. They are trying to buy power and influence in the U.S. A private organization does not have the resources to compete with the government of Saudi Arabia, the second largest largest oil producing nation in the world i've said it before and i'll keep saying it should the united states allow foreign governments to take over our major professional sports leagues listen the answer to me is as obvious no i think it's an obvious no but as some replies have said <clears throat> which are good points as some replies on this man's tweet they say well do you know that saudi's own 35 billion dollars plus in the stock market already and that doesn't even count china and other foreign governments and so basically what this person is saying and other people below it is, I'm sorry, buddy, but you're late to the party. The cat's already out of the bag. Very, very the Pandora's late box has been open. And that's what people have talked about is foreign entities are owning land around, you know, nuclear power plants in our or, or, or around military bases in our country that you've heard all these stories, whether they're all true or not. I don't know. Uh, but listen, I will say this. Just because that's already happening doesn't mean that we should just let it happen in professional sports. But at the same time, acting like we this is the first time something like this has happened, it's already happening. What governance does the United States have over a professional sport? They don't. In any, does the United States have any pull of what any professional sport does? I, I, I don't, like, I don't should know. Should we allow like, it? it? Like, like, how it, are you getting the sports how, in your country originated in your country? Your sport, but, but I, I don't know. But I mean, know. we're talking about, like this. This is a guy that's saying the U.S. government basically needs to say you cannot take over because the Saudi government's taking it over. But whatever, then, but then, but, it, but but then that means the United States becomes like owner of the organization. Yeah, and, and it's not the that, case. That's not part of our country in any sport. Right? Yeah. Right. Like the NFL. Well, look at how many owners governed by the United States of America. Like how many individual owners you have that yeah. are are foreign they're not you know i mean that's just yeah. call it what it is it's just like uh, 
should we allow it? No, but we don't have governance over. We can't deny no, it. I we can't say so no. Either. You can't do it. Yeah. Right. Or else, a lot of these people that have already left for Live Golf again, the cat's out of the bag. Well, if you could have done it, you probably would have done it already. I would have right? done it back then when yeah, this right. thing was actually coming out, and there was actually people that were way more up in arms about the Saudi connection to it. Right? Yeah. Like now, at this, at this point, everybody's like, "This just is what it is." Right now, I think there's a lot of people that are like that mm-hmm. with Live right now. There's a there's a pushback, obviously, at the beginning of it. Because it was, you know, Saudi oil back, all this stuff, right? And so I get that. But you've lost. We, we, we went over this a couple of weeks ago. Like all these main names that are already in live, this is not something that you can stop anymore. It's already happened. Mm-hmm. I mean, the what power, are we just power, retroactively going to say, hey, nope, can't do this? Well, it's too late. The power so, is already there. So now it is. If this would happen, then it does put the PGA in a mode where, okay, we have no choice but to join you. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably where Liv's going with this, right? Like, we need that last thing because we, they, cause this guy said he was going to join with us. <laughs> right. We need this last shoe to drop. And once that happens, it's over for the PGA as it exists now. And it, it is. Right. Like, how do you, how do you lose that? A guy that was that has been publicly against the live thing, from my understanding, anyway. Mm-hmm. Roy McIlroy's been against this for quite a while. Yeah, and, and if you lose him to live, put a wrap on it. It's over. No, yeah, <laughs> that's what this guy's saying. And I agree with that part. But Even though I don't he's agree not with the part of should the United States allow this? Like they don't have any. I, I don't pull see over. how they really can stop it. I mean, we could, you know, as Americans, all gather together as much as we might want and say, hey, no, you can't do that. But as far as a governing body, the United States has nothing to do with it, I don't think. Oh, yeah. Of allowing it or not allowing it. Yeah. So there you go. (laughs) Rory, after all the things he said and said this and said that, you know, when when the PGA did their under the behind the secret door agreement with Live Golf. When that happened, and when I read about it, I immediately thought, Roy McIlroy has to feel like he's absolutely been stabbed mm-hmm. in the back multiple times. And that, you know, if I'm Roy McIlroy, then I'm sitting there going, maybe it is time for me to join these guys. I thought when that story yeah. broke, I was like, because they didn't keep him in the loop on it. He was surprised, and then where did everybody come trying to get answers? They came to Rory. They put him in a real... The PGA Tour yeah. put him in a horrible spot after everything that he vouched for for the PGA Tour, and I think this is his way, if he does go to live golf, saying, well, first of all, I can't... I, I, how can you turn down all this money? Although he kind of had told other people, you know, there's a thing called loyalty, and there's a thing about this and this and this, and he made all good points. But... The PGA Tour wasn't loyal to him and what they worked no. behind the scenes and didn't. So he was actually put out kind of on an island and took some of the scrap, shrapnel. And the PGA Tour now is probably not going to pay for that mistake because mm-hmm. he's going to get paid handsomely if he lives, does live golf for $850 million. And you're more than likely the PGA Tour is in some deep, deep trouble. They're already in trouble. 20, <laughs> they, the ratings are down. They've been in trouble for a bit. They're, they're, the ratings are down. The only thing that saves them right now are the major championships, mm-hmm. which everybody's allowed to play in those, whether you're live golf or not. So if Roy, you know, that's one thing about live golf, and that's what the PGA Tour was hoping for, is that you could ban these guys from playing in the majors. And if you did that, yeah. then then maybe they wouldn't want to go play li- do live golf because they'd be obsolete eventually. They might get their money, but nobody's going to see them play. Well, when they couldn't somehow keep that from it's happening. It's not their entity. I know, so, yeah. I know, but they, they were having plans. They <laughs> exactly, talked about yeah. it, but they couldn't. They didn't have enough muscle to make it work. Yeah, exactly. Enough money to pay off people. Like not even this. the PGA Championship right. is their entity. Right, exactly. <laughs> so so they couldn't get people or force people to be like, oh, you're a live golf, you can't play. You, you, okay, you can't play on my PGA Tour events. Okay, fine, they don't care. These golfers don't care. We're, we make ton more money not playing in your events play a shorter schedule play three rounds instead of four rounds we got the private planes we can party on why wouldn't we go do this if and you're not oh you're not gonna let us play in these the the colonial oh dear god how am i gonna live (laughs) but you take away the masters okay now now that changes everything but but the masters ain't gonna the masters would never sign off and say oh yeah we're gonna sign up with the pga tour and we're gonna ban uh these 15 of the best golfers in the world because they live golf they can't play in the masters they the masters ain't stupid (laughs) they 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 want star power there they They don't they don't care they don't (laughs) they don't care if you're from mars okay if you can play golf and you're a star and you're an alien augusta national will let you do that (laughs) 
Now, if you're a star woman's player, they probably won't let you do anything. And if you don't get that line, look yeah. up the history of the Augusta National Club. You talk about a sexist organization and a racist, and a racist organization, <laughs> and that's why it still feels weird that Tiger's there as much as he's been because of all the things. But uh, And that's why it's such a big deal when he won the Masters first time there at Augusta. But the Masters is never going to say, oh, we're going to side with the PJ no. Tour here. <laughs> so what's there left for you to do if you're getting offered $100 million, $200 million, $50 million, $500 million, or in this case, according to reports, $850 million? What is keeping you from from not going to live golf? Yeah, so the only thing would be you feel like it's blood money. There's been talk about yeah, that there so forth and so on. Still think that. But, but, and, and I think Rory, you know, if the PJ Tour did him right the whole way, and when he was in on everything and knew what was going on, they were trying to work out that merger they were talking about, which I still don't understand what the heck happened with that thing. But um, Roy, Roy might, maybe he still would turn it down. I think he's a, a guy that maybe would. I think there's others that would. I know it sounds crazy. Most would not. And, you know, come on, folks. If you were offered $850 million today, I think he'd probably take it. Uh, but I think the fact that the PJ Tour just left him to take all these shots and he was left in the dark and he wasn't in the loop after everything he said and in support of the PJ Tour. Yeah. And Jay Monahan did what he did. Uh, I think Roy McIlroy, that at that point in time, I wouldn't be surprised if there was already representation from Live Golf immediately getting a hold of Roy's people. And I wouldn't be surprised if Roy's people reached out to Live Golf immediately, saying, okay, this is a bunch of crap. We just did all this for this tour, and he put himself out there. And now he's the focal point. He's your spokesperson. And, and, it's, and it's hurt his game. He even stepped down recently as the whatever his title was with the PGA Tour. I don't know what his title was, mm-hmm. but it was something to where he was the go-to guy to ask questions of any golfer on the tour to about the a PGA and all this. He was the guy. And he stepped down from that because he said, it's taken away from me to focus on my game. And so his game has suffered because of it. And the PGA Tour didn't, didn't do any many favors no. by doing the secret under-the-table merger type thing. It was a surprise and a shock to so many people, including Roy McIlroy. It sounds like Tiger Woods as well. And now Live Golf says, reportedly, they'll give him $850 million to leave an organization that kind of stabbed, not kind of, they did. They, they stabbed him in the back. If I'm Roy McIlroy, I certainly understand and don't hate him for doing this. No. I mean, you got to treat your people right. And if, if you, you don't, don't there's a yeah. price to pay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we'll continue to <laughs> see what happens here. But uh, that, this is true. Whew. You talk about getting the final, the final salvo off. That would be Rory. State, regional, and national sports talk on your schedule. The Sports Ticket Podcast. Subscribe via Apple, Google, and TuneIn Podcasts or sunflowerstateradio.com.